Hello, ladies and gentlemen, we now have John Cleary talking about uh, using projects to make more of your Y-DNA test results. Now, John is a lecturer and teaches at a university in Edinburgh. He is a member of the International Society of Genetic Genealogy, which is free to join, and everybody here should join that today. We've got an excellent Facebook group that provides lots of support for anybody that's just done a DNA test. Now, he's also involved in a pro project researching the fate of Scottish prisoners captured by Cromwell in the Civil War and transported to the Americas. So using DNA and genealogy, he's working with the prisoners' descendants. And John is going to tell us a little bit about that project, but also tell us more in general about how to get the most of your Y DNA results. So ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm welcome to John Cleary. Uh, thank you very much, Morris, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Very nice to meet you all today. Um, hope you all hear me clearly at the back. Um, yes, thank you. Yes, that's, it's, the signal's getting through. So um, I'm going to pick up on a few of the themes that Debbie was addressing in her talk um, just before me. And um, this talk may be particularly be of interest to those of you who maybe have not yet taken a DNA test, but you're thinking of doing it and you'd like to know what you can gain from it and how you can use the results to further your own research. Or, of course, you may have taken a DNA test in the past and maybe you feel you haven't quite yet extracted the maximum value from it and you'd like to think of some ideas about how you can extend and enhance the use you get from your results. And I'm um, an administrator or co-administrator of four projects which are all supported by Family Tree DNA. I must um, stress here that I'm a volunteer, I don't work for FTDNA and FTDNA provide this as a free service to the people who take tests with them. And uh, these are group projects. Um, I have one here in the middle is a surname project um, for the surnames Camp and Kemp, which are often interchangeable. Um, that's my mother's uh, surname. Um, and I'm an administrator of the Scottish DNA project. There's at least one other administrator of this project in the room at the very back, Linda, who will be speaking to you tomorrow. And uh, it's a very large project, as you see, very large, and that creates certain uh, issues of its own. And I'm an administrator of another surname project. I didn't have room to show it here. That is the Cummings and Cummins um, surname project, as well as the Scottish Prisoners project I'll talk about in the course of the, the talk. So I'm going to try and address how using these projects um, can assist you in your own research goals. And when we talk about, when I talk about genetic genealogy projects, I'm really talking about one of two things. Um, these were formal group projects, but you can also um, create your own project. That's how I started uh, in this a few years ago, by uh, deciding I wanted to work on um, my mother's surname and the genealogy of that surname, and to extend um, my understanding of the history of that surname in Ireland, particularly in Cavan, where her family came from. And so your own project can be very small scale, something which you design around your own um, results to understand them better by testing more people, but doing it in a systematic way. And of course we have these formal institutional projects, um, mainly supported by Family Tree DNA. There are um, other things known as groups and some of the other um, companies, testing companies, Family Tree DNA are the ones that have the most uh, developed infrastructure to support this kind of project-based research and allowing us therefore to have the very large surname and other projects which I've shown you earlier. So I'm, I'm going to begin by um, taking the first of these, looking at a personal project and talking about my own experience of how I began um, working with genetic genealogy. So, Debbie um, ended her talk by talking about the fishing trip, and so this is one of the, uh, the simplest kinds of projects you can do, so essentially testing yourself or maybe somebody else um, to see what comes out of it. And of course, you never know what you might find when you set about your fishing trip. You may catch all kinds of uh, surprises. Um, a bit more systematically, on a larger scale, you might have a particular hypothesis that you want to investigate. Um, so, for example, I want to know uh, whether all the people named Kemp 
and County Cavan were related to each other. So extending beyond just who matches me to look at what are the patterns of relationship amongst one family name in one region. Um, and, and you may, may have your own hypothesis, you and uh, another person, possibly with a shared surname or possibly because you may share a striking resemblance with them, uh, you may want to find out whether in fact you are related um, to that person and therefore the hypothesis style project can be one way of approaching it. Um, essentially you're looking for the possibility or the probability of a shared ancestor at some stage in the past. And then more complicated again, you may wish to go about a more full-scale family reconstruction. And that's what I moved to start doing in my research on the camps of County Cavan, in which I was looking for the most recent common ancestor, that's what MRCA here stands for, of not just two people, but of a number of lines of, of a family who no longer believe themselves to be related. Because whatever folk memory, oral history, and documentary evidence of relationship there may have been, uh, had been lost. So therefore, DNA became the only way to begin to reconstruct those family relationships. And I'm going to begin by looking at my own fishing trip, how I started in genetic genealogy um, a number of years ago. So I was persuaded, uh, against my better judgment initially, by somebody I know in Scotland, to take a STR test. And I tested six or seven markers, and then extended that later to the 111 markers. And of course, I expect I'm bound to have a few matches. Look, Cleary, lots of Clearies in Ireland. Some of them are bound to match me. I'll probably be a Neil and I hostages descendant, like half of Ireland seems to be. So I thought in those days. And in actual fact, I soon found that 111 markers I had the uh, magnificent total of no matches at all. And when I scaled down to the 6 or 7 marker level, I still had no matches. And even at 37 markers, no matches. I was getting worried by now. I was going to think, well, am I the last of my tribe? Has everybody else I'm related to in the male line died out or been eliminated in some disaster? Um, so finally, I've got a match when you drill down to 25 marker level. And those of you who are active in genetic genealogy will know that 25 markers is not really uh, enough to uh, be sure the match you have is that uh, close or reliable. And there's a further problem because this person who matched me at the rather distant level of 2 out of 25 had a different name to me. Uh, his name was Gorman, and his ancestor was a, a John Gorman from County Tipperary in the 18th century. Now, at least there's some consolation here in the origin, because my father's family also come from South Tipperary, and we know we share a very close locality. Of course, we have no idea how we're related, and that's one of the big questions I haven't yet managed to settle. So, no Cleary matches, and just this Gorman. Um, and ultimately, the real explanation is that the people I am related to, and there are people out there, of course, who are related to me in the male line, have not tested. Um, I suspect, because a lot of uh, people who tested STRs are uh, American, um, I do not have many people who have migrated to the Americas who have also then gone on to test. So I suspect there probably are people out there who relate to me, I just haven't found them yet. But what I did do was um, I wanted to know whether, because um, I wasn't related to any other people by the name of Cleary from Tipperary or elsewhere in, in, in Munster. So I wanted to know whether, in fact, there was a uh, degree of relationship to other people with my name in that area. And my, my father knew um, some people in Clonmel who he grew up thinking of as cousins. Um, and he, his family, their family, visited often and regarded themselves as cousins. But once we began to look closely at these two lines, we couldn't actually identify what type of cousins they were, um, just vaguely cousins. Um, and so this seemed a very ripe area for gen genetic genealogy because with this we can investigate whether or not we actually are related um, and we can certainly find evidence to prove we're not related if we're not and thus disprove this long-held family belief. So um, this is my line um, and I also can track myself back to an 18th century gentleman who came from Killing Butler, uh, closer care in Tipperary um, and this tracks down eventually, here's my grandfather tracks down to me down here. And the other family were from Clonmel, and they can't go back as far. They know that their ancestor was a Thomas Cleary, um, born somewhere in maybe 1825, 
who winds up in uh, Adgiha Klosikon now in the late 19th century. And um, there are a couple of Thomas Clearys in uh, my line um, who could be possible candidates. And for example, um, here we have um, someone here who is, was known and was uh, believed to be the same as this Thomas Cleary by my um, family, but actually he's too young. This couldn't be the same man. We, we know from the marriage history of this Thomas that can't be the same person. And we also think we found him in England, um, married but childless. So it's not him, but a generation back, there's another Thomas here, um, born in 1813, who is the um, brother of my great, great, great grandfather. And so a possibility there. But one slight snag is that we do have the marriage certificate of this Thomas in question. Uh, this is his second, or possibly his third marriage, in 1874, um, when he was 50 years old. Slight problem here. So, 50 years old, at least, well, maybe that's what he was telling her. So, it's always, always possible it could be him, but um, obviously there's a problem here with the dates. And so, the, the genealogical evidence is not great. Um, so, the question is then, is there an actual relationship? Um, maybe they're a totally different family that don't relate to us at all, and therefore this belief in cousins was just nothing that was true, it was just really neighbours, cousins in the sense of being neighbours who share a surname. So I set out to um, find a descendant of that line who tested this year, um, 37 markers, and here are the results. This is the result of me, the upper one, and the um, other person down below. And magnified here, you can see that there are four points of difference between us on 37 markers. And three of them are just one step differences. So that's not too bad. But here we've got a rather big difference here, which um, according to the various models you use for comparing differences in STRs, we can say this is the stepwise model assumes that each mutation happens one step at a time, would suggest we've actually got three mutations here. And that would mean that the difference between me and him is six out of 37. That's quite high. On the other hand, we could just treat this as being one mutation, one dramatic mutation, where a movement of three um, happened in one go. And I don't know if that's likely or possible, but obviously there is a big difference here. Maybe that did happen in just one movement, in which case by the infinite alleles model, we just call this one mutation, and therefore he would be a difference of four out of 37 from me. So that's the data. The question is, what does it mean? What can I conclude from this result? Am I related to this man, or am I not? What do you think? That's where I put it to the vote. How many of you think that, yes, this is enough evidence for me to claim a relationship to this man? A few hands go, thank you. Oh, I'll come, come to the back here, thank you very much. How many of you would say no? This is not close enough, you wouldn't, yeah. I've got to say, thank you, Kathy, it is, it is rather on the edge, uh, I think. Um, partly because if this is a stepwise mutation, one, two, three, then this would need to have a number of generations to work through. So, yes, there may be some similarities, but it could also be a long way back. Um, so, one thing in favour of the argument that we may have a close relationship is a particular marker that I carry which is within the, the first 12 of my markers, and it is, for those who are familiar with the jargon, the marker is called DYS392, and I have a, a value here of 11. Now, most people who are R1B, which I also am, will have a value here of 13. And, in fact, we can look up some very useful statistics online. Uh, a fantastic site here put, it, put it, uh, together a long time ago, um, but there's nothing better, so I still use it. Um, it's Leo Little's... Um, list of the frequencies of particular marker values according to certain haplogroups. And here we have the uh, data for DYS392. And looking along here, we have um, R1B at the bottom, and 86% of R1B men will have 13 at this point. Whereas 0.0% of R1B men have 11 at this point. So it's me. I have it. Uh, I'm now the Probably not the first, there are others, and match a few who do. But this is so rare that it does seem to be distinctive. Now, we must 
avoid falling into a trap here. I fell into this trap when I first began uh, working on this three years ago, to assume that it's so rare, therefore it can only have occurred once in the R1B subclade that I'm part of, therefore anybody who shares this marker value will be related to me. No, we mustn't assume that. I absolutely do know it has occurred more than once in even people who are not too far away from me. So we have to be careful with this. One STR value on its own is not enough to be conclusive. But I feel that since the other tester shares this value, and he's either 4 from 37 or 6 out of 37 close enough to me uh, with this rare marker value, I feel there's enough evidence here to suggest strong evidence of relationship. It's all about probabilities. I've proven nothing. But I've generated some evidence here from the genetics that we are related. Of course, what I can't say, going back to my tree, is where that relationship is. It will not tell me the name of our most recent common ancestor. But now I've got something to work on. We can go back and see if we can find more evidence that might actually help us tie this down. My suspicion is that it's neither of those two Thomases I showed you earlier, and that the um, relationship may be at least another generation back into the 18th century. But there is a relationship there. So here's an example, then, of how um, you can put together a very, very small project. To me, this is a DNA project, um, which, I, which I ran over a couple of years, and it has given me a very useful and interesting conclusion. And uh, I think this is um, definitely worthwhile. Most of you probably have a, a matching pattern more like this, um, in which you'll find people who share your surname matching you um, to a certain genetic distance level, but also other surnames. And, of course, how you treat those other surnames is a very important question and you need to deal with in your research. And I'll talk a bit about that later on if I, if I have time. So what then constitutes a match? Um, it should be somebody who's related to you in the time since the use of surnames began. And this is um, a rather vague definition in the sense that surname use begins much earlier than widespread surname use and widespread surname use in England begins earlier than it does in Wales and also in, in Ireland as well. So what we mean by the surname era can mean anything to do with when surnames are first used and passed on um, from father to son uh, or when they become widespread enough for us to be able to recognise um, surname patterns. Um, but this we can call genealogical time and that's what we're looking for. We're looking for evidence that the DNA patterns we identified are close enough to allow us to conclude that there is a relationship in genealogical time to a certain degree of probability. Um, but it is very probabilistic, and so family tree DNA have their own criteria, um, which I, this is my own personal view, it's not endorsed by family tree DNA, but I feel that it's a 10% threshold. If your um, numbers, number of differences um, between two people on a test is 10% or fewer, then you have um, evidence of likely matching within um, genealogical time. But these are the more precise thresholds that family tree DNA use. And so I was talking here about a 37 marker test. And if we do say 4 out of 37 is the allowed threshold, then on one of those models of calculating distance, we are matching and therefore we can conclude that we relate within genealogical time. But we, we still have four differences, and so maybe this is actually pushing the relationship back even, even further than I'm um, assuming, maybe back into the early modern period or before. Um, and so these are questions which I need to address now in my own research. Um, it's very important to say here that if you test somebody who you think has your surname, should be related, and you get a result, say, 5 out of 37, just as with me, it doesn't mean that they're not related. It doesn't mean that you're not related to you even relatively closely. And equally, if you test someone and you find that they have a distance from you of 3 out of 37, this does not mean they definitely are related. It's one piece of evidence which you must look at critically and assess what other forms of evidence you can find to support that conclusion. But there is a phenomenon called convergence in which uh, STR test results can move towards each other. And therefore, if, if those of you who are uh, likely to be in the very common uh, haplogroup subclade in Ireland, N222, for example, you'll be finding yourselves getting um, apparently clear matching results of 6 out of 67, for example, from people who are actually not your matches. 
because a lot of convergence has gone on within this haplogroup, and therefore you probably need to look for closer um, um, scores to be quite sure you have got someone who will be a, a relative of yours. So again, the conclusion here is these are guidelines. They're not rules. You can't say, I'm 3 out of 37, I must match this person. Actually, that's your starting point to go back to genealogy and find more evidence for why you may well match this person. So make sure I'm not blethering on too great length. Okay, good. So I'm talking about genetic distance. I think Debbie may have mentioned this in her talk earlier, but I mentioned it again. Genetic distance, often referred to by those who drop jargon, more often than we should do, is the GD. And the GD is the number of steps of difference you have between two uh, sets of results. Um, so here on this matching list um, of a, one of the members of my Kemp project, you can see the, the GDs given for how the tester matches these people. Four of them are called Kemp, one called Taylor. Um, and this Mr. Taylor actually we do know is connected, though not as closely as the other Kemp's. That's another story. Does it matter if the surname is different? And here I think you'll get many different answers depending on who you ask. I say a match is a match in principle. Um, however, you need to be sceptical if the surname is different and you need to have a higher threshold of evidence um, that there may be a connection. Of course there are what we call the NPE, the non-parental event, um, in which people acquire surnames that do not match their genetic descent. Um, I'm not going to go into those as a complex area of its own. Um, and therefore, we need to allow for that to happen. The Mr. Taylor I showed you just now is without doubt uh, a case of this. Um, but if the surname is different, don't dismiss the match. Investigate it and see if you can find evidence that will back up the possibility of relationship there. But do be aware, there can be false positives. It's much less likely when the surname is the same and it's much less likely when you test at least 67 markets. So, here's some principles here on how to go about setting up your own um, DNA surname project. Um, begin by researching the distribution of your surname. Where is it found? Uh, where is it most populous? Um, decide what question you want to ask. So it's very important, not, although the fishing trip can be fun to do, you'll get better results if you target your research with a particular set of questions or hypotheses that you want to see whether um, the, D the DNA can actually uh, answer. Um, and when you have done your initial tests, don't forget to go back to the genealogical research because what the DNA is doing is giving you avenues to follow up further. And the ideal project will use both genetic evidence and genealogical evidence to come to firmer conclusions about relationship. And do, if you're beginning work on this kind of project, do check on the Family Tree DNA pages to see whether there is a surname project already existing. There are, I believe, seven, 8,000 surname projects of Family Tree DNA. And it's very likely that all of your surnames will have a project already. If there is, join it. Contact the administrator. If you're eager, you may find the administrator is looking for other people to assist as co-administrators. And, um, and then you can be brought into the infrastructure that Family Tree DNA offer to support the, the work of the surname projects. If there isn't one, set one up. It's easy to do. Family Tree DNA will create a web page for you, and you can then be the administrator. There are many very, very good surname projects which consist of um, a very small number of names. A very good one of the I know of the surname Leddingham in Scotland um, has only five or six members, but that's because it's not a common surname. And um, the, that surname project has found some very interesting results about the Leddingham's of Aberdeenshire and around. So any, any surname, any size, can have a project. Now, why we, why we do this? Well, obviously we want to know various things, but I think that some very key things to look out for when you join or set up a surname project. And I think sharing information is vital. This, to me, is the, uh, the most important aspect of setting up these projects. We get nowhere by doing a fishing trip and then not comparing our results with others. So it's sharing of information, our results, and the context we have that makes these um, strong. There are also special tools for administrators, um, which are available through FTDNA and by third parties. Um, 
you can gain a lot from other pairs of eyes, looking at your data, pointing out things you hadn't missed or not thought of. Um, and very important, is family tree DNA offer a relational um, database of results, which is dynamically checking constantly as all new results come in for new matches. And therefore, um, this database underpins all the projects, but also allows you to show the results of your members, which you can then yourself group and show what the relationships are within those. Um, if you're going to join a project, and I hope you will if you're testing, I'd just like to make an appeal for some housekeeping of your own in your family tree DNA uh, site. Uh, many people neglect this, and it's a pity, um, but it's very important, crucial, to enter your genealogical information. There are many empty spaces in projects where a, an earliest known ancestor will be very, very useful, and it helps other people to assess the likelihood of whether your results might be connected to them. And you can do this very easily in your account by going in to find your personal information, where the genealogy is, and then entering uh, your um, oldest known direct paternal ancestor and your oldest known direct maternal ancestor. These are mine, Thomas Cleary, you saw already from my uh, from Rogerstown in uh, Tipperary, from my previous pedigree. My earliest known maternal ancestor is uh, Alicia Connell from Iron Hills in County Kildare. Actually, I think I've got one gener generation further back, but I haven't actually put her in yet, so we're still working on this one. Please do this, it's absolutely essential. Um, and it's useful if it's in the form name, plus a significant date, birth or death, whatever you have, marriage if you don't have either of those, and a place. And um, you see here the example for family tree DNA shows the date, the name, but they, they miss off the place. And I would urge them actually to change this because places are, are vital for assessing whether that particular Cleary is the Cleary you may be interested in, for example. Um, if you have time, please add a family tree as well. And if you're doing the family finder or autosomal testing, a family tree is essential. A lot of people don't do it, but you really do need to put your family tree up so people can investigate where the relationship may be once they're comparing their results with yours. Um, something else I want to mention here, and this is a controversial issue, but it's the, the privacy issue. Um, family tree DNA this year changed its default privacy settings in the accounts, and many new testers do not know this, and even though they may wish to let their results be publicly viewable, they haven't changed the default settings in their account, and therefore their results are hidden from the view of most people. So... Um, I would recommend, it's entirely up to you, of course, you have full control over the privacy and access to your results, but in the interest of sharing information, I would persuade you to um, use settings similar to these. Um, this is the default setting for who may view your most distant ancestor, and really, what is the point? You know who it is. Um, what's the point of no one else being able to see it but you? So you can go into your account and you can change it so that project members of the projects you join can also see your most distant ancestor. I would think, I wish there's another um, setting that allows us to open it up to everybody, because I think this really is useful information. There's no real reason to keep it secret, unless of course you have a particularly sensitive family uh, adoption issue or something else that has a, give you a good reason to keep this private. Um, and then, who may view your DNA results in projects? You may choose anyone, project members, um, so again, there's a more restricted setting. Project members will be able to see your results, but again, I would um, urge you to make them visible to all people because you may get someone coming along with your surname saying, hmm, well, I match. Are there people who might come from my part of wherever um, in this project? Oh, yes, there is. I'll go and test. So by opening this to anybody, you're actually potentially attracting new testers who might match you. So that's the housekeeping side then. And... Um, There are four general types of project of family tree DNA. Um, and I'll come back to what they are in a moment. But there are project pages for all of these projects. This is the, the New Look Family Tree DNA Groups pages, which I've been using this year. Um, quite attractive. And on the, on the web page, we can put contextual information. And um, here, for example, we have a link 
Um, well, first we have the administrator addresses, email addresses. But the other administrator, Andrew Kemp, who set up this Kemp project, has been building a one-name study for the Kemp surname for a number of years. He's registered the name with the, with the goons. And he has this database here, which he's uh, assembling and collecting every family line of Kemp's that you can find with the supporting genealogical information. So what you have here is something probably not perfect, but it's a bit more reliable, I think, than the kind of trees you may see at Ancestry, for example. And we're now trying to find a way to link this to the project so people can uh, move directly, click between the two, and move from pedigree to the project or from a lineage in our project to the relevant pedigree um, so the two will then support each other. That's something which we're working on at the moment. And this, of course, is your standard results page. This is the um, lineage of the Kemps of Cavan. As you see, I've now tested, I think it's 13 or 14 people. Um, this is over the last uh, three, four years. Um, and this is the, the colorized view, which lets you see where the differences are within this group. And again, there are a few scattered around, some of which are significant, because when several people share uh, a particular marker, we have evidence here of branching. Um, I'm also administrator of the Scottish DNA Project, which is a geographical project. And here I have an example here of a recent innovation, Family Tree DNA, introduced this year, which is the activity feed. Now, I know that this is very much, uh, many administrators do, don't particularly like these. There's, there's again a lot of discussion about how useful they are, and many projects don't use them. Um, they often have their own Yahoo lists or Facebook pages. So uh, there are other forums in which people can discuss results of the project. But I actually like this. This is a massive project, and the few administrators do not have time to answer all the queries that we are receiving. And the great thing about this is there are a lot of members who are also project administrators elsewhere, and a lot of, a lot of members who know a lot about gene gene genealogy, DNA, Scottish clans, Scottish family history. And so members answer, answer questions to other members. And therefore, information is being shared through this uh, medium. And I think this is a, a great innovation. Uh, we chip in occasionally, but we don't have to answer every query because there are many people who are sharing their own information. And again, creating something of buzz um, around the project. It's not merely a passive listing of results. There is this active discussion of what the results may mean going on around it. So the four times a project I mentioned earlier then, um, surname projects are self-explanatory. I'm going to run through um, the other three first, and then if, if I'm allowed to carry on speaking about Morris, I'll show you a quick case study of a surname project. We might run out of time before we get there. Um, the haplogroup projects, I think, are essential for all testers. We all have a haplogroup, which is identified by um, the uh, deep level marker, uh, or, or SNP, which a deep ancestor of ours, an ancient ancestor, thousands of years ago, had as a mutation and passes on to all of us. So the, uh, the R haplogroup, um, which may have appeared around, somewhere around about here, and I think now the current thinking is maybe further east, I believe, um, has a particular marker um, which identifies it and then divides, as other markers appear, the R1A group identified by marker M207, uh, which all of them carry, because they've all inherited it from their distant ancestor. And so the haplogroup projects work at this kind of level and below at a smaller grouping, subgroupings within these, uh, and to track the shared deep ancestry of all the members. Um, I recommend all testers to join one of these as well as joining a um, surname project. We're all given a predicted haplogroup uh, when we test, and we can then con try to confirm that by taking a SNP test to see whether the prediction is correct. And if we join the Haplogroup project, we can receive a lot of expert advice from some of the, the finest minds and the most active people involved in genetic genealogy. So a lot of the research into ancestry at the cutting edge is done by the Haplogroup administrators, and they can give excellent advice to people. So I recommend join your Haplogroup project, and um, even if you're not particularly interested in deep ancestry yourself, Knowing your haplogroup is a very important tool in making sense of your own results, even for your own gen genealogical research. Um, so here we have some of the things that haplogroup administrators produce. This is the heat map of the L21, the major, um, in Ireland at least, uh, and Scotland and Wales um, and Brittany. 
a haplogroup or subhaplogroup of R1b, and with a majority of males in this room, if you're Irish, you'll be a member of L21, as am I, um, as are you? Uh, yes, yeah. yes, yeah, and, and so on. And um, here we see the, the distribution based on uh, the research of people in, in haplogroup projects. Um, they also build trees. Haplo trees are trees coming down, starting from the mutations and deducing the great, the deep family tree of all the people who have further mutations. And many of the haplogroups produce excellent trees, beautiful trees, informative trees. There are many different types. Uh, my own prize for the most beautiful tree of 2015 goes to Ian MacDonald, uh, administrator at U, the R1B U106 project, who produced this fantastic tree with a, an amazing um, contextual report on the, the possible history of the, the, U, the U106 clan, or haplogroup, often associated with, with the Germanic peoples. It's common in um, Scandinavia, in Germany, the Netherlands, common to in England. And, of course, there are some also in Ireland. And um, Ian began his report by saying, everything in this report is wrong. We just don't know how wrong. <laughs> and that, of course, is the point about much of this was of research. It is speculative. It is probabilistic. But all the same, people like Ian are putting together a deep history of descent going back here um, into the Neolithic. Um, I won't say very much about geographical projects. I've mentioned already the Scottish DNA project. Um, what we're trying to do is we're trying to build up a representative picture of the most common forms, haplogroups, and subclades of DNA in Scotland. And there are some which are associated with Scotland, or a discussion about a group called L1065, whether they may be um, representative of the Pictish people in Scotland or not. Um, the DF41 group is associated with the Royal Stuart household, and there are others uh, of particular interest in Scotland. And so we're trying to build up a representative picture of Scottish DNA. Um, and it's also very useful for, for strays, people like me, who don't have lots of matches. How do we fit in um, if we don't have people that we're obviously close to? In our haplogroup projects, we may find that at the, the regional level there may be um, things we can discover. I'm also a member of the, of the Munster Irish project, and we had a very interesting talk about that yesterday, um, even though my haplogroup wasn't mentioned. Um, and Morris mentioned earlier the, the Scottish Prisoners Project, which I'm an administrator of. And I did speak about this last year for those who were, who were present a year ago, so I won't um, talk at great length about this, but this is what I call a heritage or a cultural heritage project. Um, in 1650, there was a battle in Scotland at uh, Dunbar on the coast, in which I think it's fair to say the Scots snatched defeat from the jaws of victory. That Cromwell's new model army was surrounded, and they came off their defensive position and allowed Cromwell's um, cavalry to smack them and destroy them in the space of an hour. It was a devastating defeat for the Scots, and um, some of the numbers um, that arose out of this are quite shocking. Here we go, this is the uh, location of the battle. Uh, the Scots were here on a hill overlooking the English trapped in the town of Dunbar, desperately trying to get enough ships in to um, get their men out of Dunbar, and the Scots came off the hill in the morning and allowed, became sitting targets for the well-organised Cromwellian cavalry. And um, they, the, many of the survivors, possibly about as many as 5,000 prisoners, uh, were marched to Durham Cathedral as prisoners. And... And again, the numbers are quite devastating. 10,000 prisoners, half of them were wounded, and Cromwell released them. So they were no longer a threat to him. So the fit ones were then marched down the Durham. Sort of 4,000 here, about 1,000 are believed to have escaped en route, and many died en route because there wasn't the food they needed. And so when they reached um, Durham, the dying continued, now also from the flux, as we refer to, probably dysentery, and it's believed that 1,700 died in Durham alone. So these bodies must be buried somewhere around Durham. Um, the survivors were not returned to Scotland. They were transported, uh, most of them across the Atlantic. Uh, we know that 150 sailed to uh, Boston in 1650 on the ship the Unity. And we know a year later another 300 approximately um, captured from the Battle of Worcester when the Royalist army of um, Charles was defeated uh, in 1651, followed them. We know about these people. These are 
the ancestors of the um, group I'm working with. But there are many others. We think some may have been sent to Virginia and indentured in the Virginian plantations. Um, some may have been sent to European wars to fight uh, as mercenaries, and many of them may have been barbadoed by many of the uh, Irish um, dispossessed uh, from, Crom from the Cromwellian Wars in Ireland in the 1640s and 50s. Um, and the, the ones who were barbadoed would probably not have faced a very good fate um, because the conditions were, were pretty well close to slavery, worse than slavery in some respects. So again, that's a controversial area I won't go into. Um, some worryingly may have been sent to the gold mines of Guinea, and you can imagine they would never have come back from that. So what we do know about are these ones who went to um, the Americas because there are good records uh, for them. Um, and of course, the story took a, a new twist this month, last month, when an announcement from Durham University revealed the discovery of uh, 18 or possibly as many as 28 skeletons who were buried beneath a cafe at Durham University Library. And the um, Durham archaeological team investigating this are certain that these are uh, skeletons of some of the buried prisoners. Um, all of them are male. They're all aged between 16 and 25. Tell us, well, most of them tell us something about the ages of the typical soldier at the time. But some of them were as young as 13 from analysis of the skeletons, and they would have been the youngest soldiers. Um, two of them are in their 30s only, out of 28. Um, none of them show signs of deaths from battle trauma or injury. So, again, backing the belief of the, um, the starvation and the, the dysentery. Um, Carbon-14 dates them to the dates when the battle may have occurred. Um, and most of them are from Scotland, uh, or northern England, according to isotopic analysis of the skeletons. But there are three that showed signs of having grown up in Europe, possibly from the Low Countries or northern Germany, including one of the two older males. So, again, possibly mercenaries uh, fighting the Scots army, uh, organising uh, commands of troops, and so on. So, um, we have asked the Durham team if they're going to take ancient DNA. They said, mm, it's very expensive, uh, we don't know. And uh, we do know that the skeletons will be reburied at some stage in a ceremony in um, Durham. Um, and the group I'm working with in America are very hopeful that some ancient DNA will be taken from this. But at the moment, that's not certain. But DNA is the way in which the um, group in America are trying to make connections with their own ancestral relative in Scotland. And so here is a page from the um, DNA project, grouped according to descendants or believed descendants of the, the prisoners. Um, and some of these have got, have got pretty good genealogical evidence that they are descended from the person they claim. Others a bit mixed, maybe. Um, and unfortunately, the surviving records of Scotland in the 1650s are very poor. It was a period of great disruption, and um, there's very, very little. Um, I, I was hoping at one stage that records of the Scottish um, church, the Kirk Sessions, may help us identify some of the people who were sent into the musters. But uh, I don't think that's likely. And so, in a way, DNA seems to be all they can hope for. But um, just um, before I came on this trip, uh, one of the members told me, um, who's uh, researching the, the descendants of Alexander Bow, that she had, one of her people, had matched with a man who's got documented descent, named Bow, uh, to Larbert in Stirlingshire, um, whose ancestor left Stirlingshire in the 19th century. So again, there's a pretty firm connection to Scotland there. So, and she match, her, her, her person matches this person at two out of 67. So it's looking very encouraging that the first um, person has found their first um, Scottish connection through, um, through this project, which she will be investigating further. So again, the dream of most of the members here is to find matches who are Scottish, or who've got a clear um, genealogical relationship with Scotland. Um, so far, most of them are finding matches who are also American, believe themselves to be Scottish, but haven't yet been able to demonstrate that they actually are. So, do I have time to talk about the surname project? Not really. Um, I think what I'll do is I'll, I'll wrap up, but I'll say that um, if you are going to conduct a surname project, sort of as I talked about earlier, um, there are a number of things you can focus on. Do focus on the genealogy. 
Uh, it's very important to do the two in tandem. And secondly, it's very important also to um, bear in mind there are lots of tools and utilities around there which can help you to interpret. But if you're new to it, then try and get the advice of a project administrator until you become more familiar with it yourself. And think about the right questions you can ask uh, in order to um, get meaningful answers that a DNA project can give. I'll show just two slides, really. Um, I've totally mentioned in research the name Kemp in CAV, and I'm also interested in Kemp's from Limerick. And I do know about Kemp's in Cork. And my very early questions was whether the, the Cavan and Cork Kemp's are related to each other. And I could express this as a hypothesis, which I could falsify. And the hypothesis was a Cork and Cavan Kemp's are related to each other as one family. And using DNA, I could immediately falsify this because we see that the Cavan Kemp's are R1A, have a kind of a Scandinavian looking um, a Y DNA there, whereas the um, Cork Kemp's are R1B U106 and look a bit English, if anything. So um, we immediately falsify the hypothesis that these two family groups were related to each other. And this is how I'd recommend going ahead with your own genealogical research. Ask questions that DNA can answer. Make hypotheses that you can disprove if the results are not how you want them to be. Um, and this way you can build a body of evidence that the relationships you are trying to find are likely to be there. But do bear in mind, it's still a very probabilistic exercise. So thank you very much for listening. I'll stop now and allow you to ask me any questions if there's still time. Mark Morgan. Um, great presentation. Um, so my question is, I'm kind of a stray, according to your terminology, and so, and although not quite as severe, so I have no matches at 111 markers. Um, at 67, I have eight or so, but none of them have the same surname. Um, the closest is five. Um, so. I'm wondering if you, and you mentioned the bias that um, most of FGDNA data is American, but you could also argue that so many people immigrated from um, Ireland in the 1800s to America or Canada or Australia where FGDNA was strong, that it's a pretty good proxy of most parts of Ireland. So do you have a theory about what, about strays that explains you know, what type of people were, were strays. Maybe they got wiped out by Cromwell in the 1600s. Or I think, yes, I think it's a good question. And funny enough, we were talking about this very question last night at dinner. And I think that um, there's no type of person who's a stray. I think it's, it's purely, since DNA mutations are random, um, and of course to extend survivability of people across history is not random, but can be almost random. And so I think you will have lines that die out, and you will have families that bush and have lots of male lines. We're talking about Y-DNA, so lots of male lines where the Y chromosome will be passed down. Many lines along with the same surname. Um, I, mean, I, I know that from my study of my mother's uh, family, the Kemp's or Kevin, there are a lot of males, um, male branches if you go back three generations. But a lot of them had large families with lots of daughters, and there are now far fewer direct male lines carrying that particular um, Y chromosome. In fact, in my own immediate family, there's only one left, which is my uncle. And so uh, lines do die out. And I think there's two things, really. I think in history, uh, in the past, there are many more um, DNA lines that have died out. But also, um, if you're comparing colonial America with Ireland or England or Scotland, there are also there's more, there's more variation here than there will be in America because the um, people who migrated to America carried a subset of the DNA that existed in Ireland, England, Scotland, Wales. And so over time, there's always been more, more variety in, in, in the Isles. Some of those lines will die out. There are probably many more lines that haven't been tested. And uh, clearly, I was the first person descended in my um, male line going right back to probably um, the year zero who'd taken the DNA test. That doesn't necessarily mean there's no one else in America or Australia or, any, or Ireland who will also match me. Um, because what you can do is take the project approach. So having, not having any matches, I've now begin to, began to look for them. and looking for them in Tipperary because that's where the family comes from. 
Um, I have found one since then who tested ancestry years ago. I can't contact him. He, he, he's American. So there is a, an, is a migrant line in America. And I can pursue these and try to expand my database to have a better image of what my paternal family actually does look like. Yeah. Thanks, John. Well, just to give you a bit of information on what to expect from this new ID and test, I did an analysis of the Back to Our Past and who do you think you are in England, um, people who recruited about 163 men who did a wide DNA test. 25% of you will not have any matches at YDNA 37. 50% of you will have between 1 and 10 matches, and 25% of you will have more than 10 matches. So it varies a lot um, depending. Well, it, it's, it's a genetic lottery, really. You could be one of the unlucky ones that has no matches at, at uh, YDNA 37, or you could be one of the really lucky ones that has lots of matches uh, that accounts for about 25% of people. We have a question here from Tom Brazel. Thank you, Maris. Thanks. Thanks for the talk, John. It's very interesting. Can I ask a question, really, because a lot of this depends on people doing uh, the STR testing and matching that family tree DNA sort of uh, provide for that. The question I'm asking is, how difficult, is it, how difficult is it to reconcile those STR matches with matches that you would get from SNP testing, Big Y testing and that? And the reason I ask that question is that I have found SNP matches subsequently that didn't appear anywhere in my uh, STR matches. And so, you know, that, that was, it proved unhelpful to me in that regard. Yeah, um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily say it's unhelpful. If you're finding matches, then they are matches and there's something there to investigate. Of course, many of your SNP, SNP matches may be very, very old. and they, I don't know how recent those SNPs are or whether it's from a, a big Y test or just from, from a SNP panel. If it's a SNP panel, they'll be old. Yeah. But I think, um, I think um, those people who are doing SNP testing will also have done STR testing at the moment. So we haven't reached a stage where the first test you do is a, is a full read of your Y chromosome, and you, and you won't know what your STRs are beforehand. So I think most people are probably doing at least a 37 marker test, some are only 12, but at least a 37 marker test, um, to have some idea of who they match before they begin to do SNP testing. Um, and I think the two need to be done in tandem uh, together, and that's, that's how SNPs can become powerful, I think on their own, then they're not enough. I think even if we begin to read um, full sequences without doing any, any prior STR testing, I think we still need the STRs to help us do the fine branching of trees as we get closer and closer to modern times. Because most of you, if you're genealogists, you're interested probably in descent within the last 300 years. So I think STRs remain very important. Even SNPs also become very important. Yeah. Thank you very much, John. Just, just to uh, so to say what I got from the SDR testing yeah. was one, I mean my paternal history was in Leinster for hundreds of years, I had to come to terms with the fact that we originated in Munster sometime before that and that was a little bit of a shock, particularly to my Leinster rugby <laughs> supporting sons and the like. But the other thing is the SNPs now are approaching sort of documented history now. You're talking about SNPs that only occurred yeah. a few hundred years ago. And it can be difficult to reconcile the SCR results with the very specific, quite recent SNP results. Uh, I think I'll be talking about this in the afternoon, but we have found in the projects I'm involved in um, predictions based on STR testing being confounded by SNP results. But I think that's great. I like that. It's a new discovery. Very good question. Are you going to be talking about convergence to an extent this afternoon? Great. Um, maybe. So convergence is going to be a... Yeah, uh, that, that's going to be very, very important. Other questions? Any other questions for John? Uh, one question here. Uh, I'm Mark Morgan's son. And, uh, no, he's my son. Ah. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm way old. Here's Dad. <laughs> yes, Dad. Yeah. Uh, we... On one of these STR 19, I think, we have uh, 10, which is very unusual. Mm -hmm. A few years ago, nobody else in the database had mm. uh, What does that mean for you? I think on its own it means nothing, but I think in comparison with other things it can be useful. It sounds like you have a signature marker there, and I think I probably want to know, do you share that signature marker with other Morgans? Um, can we identify branches of Morgans on the basis of that STR change? But I, I, what I'm 
finally, I mentioned the trap I fell into earlier of basing too much on a single STR change. And with STRs, we need to put together several of them and look for a pattern across more than one to be sure we are finding something that's unique to one branch. But I think you probably have a signature marker that, uh, along with other markers, will be very important and significant to you. Of course, the other big marker to look out for is the surname. So if you've got two people with the same surname and the same rare marker value, then that could be very tough, so that could be very, very descriptive for that particular surname. Mm -hmm. yeah. Descriptive. Diagnostic, if you like. Diagnostic, yes. Yeah. Great, well, we have to call it uh, time there, unfortunately, because we are about to go into the next uh, topic. But please, can I ask you to give a big thank you to John Terry for